How are we doing? Good. All right. That's what I like to hear. So when I was in third grade, no, fifth grade, I uh, wanted a Sony Walkman. And the opportunity presented itself to me. There was this guy that came to our school who was essentially, you know, employing children to make money for his chocolate company. And uh, he basically brought in this chocolate and he encouraged the students from our school to sell the chocolate in order to raise money to get prices. And as I realized later, I was drumming up like hundreds of dollars for this guy and for my school so I could get a $10 Walkman. At any rate, it seemed totally worth it at the time. Maybe some of you feel that way in your jobs. Uh, anyway, so I had this box of chocolate, these mint chocolates, and I was walking around our neighborhood. It was hot outside. We lived in Chatsworth. Uh, and uh, super hot, and I'm walking around with my chocolates, selling chocolate. I'm way far from them. I get super thirsty, and I just have nothing to drink. I'm so thirsty. I'm going door to door asking people to buy my chocolates to support my church. I get so thirsty, I get the dumb idea that maybe I should eat some of my chocolate. So I dig in, and I start eating chocolate, and it doesn't dissolve. It just turns into to brown gunk in my mouth, and now I've just gone from being thirsty to really suffering. So I'm walking around with like chocolate in my mouth, somebody knocks on the door, I go, hello, would you like to uh, buy some chocolate? There's sweat coming down my face, and I'll never forget this old lady, one time I knocked on the door, she must have seen it on my face, because she didn't even say anything, she left the door open, but she came back with a tall glass of ice water, with a little like bead of water coming down the side, you know, a little frost around the edges, and I just was like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> drank the water, and I never forget, when you're that thirsty, nothing is as good as a tall drink of ice cold water. Can I get an amen, people? Amen. There is something about being thirsty, and so today, I, I want to begin with that story, because I want you to think of a time in which you were just so thirsty. You felt so thirsty, you would have done anything for a glass of water. That is the human condition. Our souls are thirsty. They're thirsty. They need to drink something. There's something in the heart of every human being that is thirsty, that wants to drink. You have a desire and you wonder, how can this ever be satiated? Today we're continuing a series on the Psalms. And the Psalms, today we're talking about the Psalms of longing. Psalms of longing are the psalms in which David or one of the psalmists says, Lord, I long for you, I desire you, this, this reverberating from the heart that I want God, I need God, and yet an almost desperate heart that can't seem to attain or acquire God in its wanting. In Psalm chapter 63, which was read today, David says, you God are my God. Diligently I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole body longs for you in a dry and parched land. You hear the thirst? There's just David's just complete desire is to, to want and to, to, to be with and to experience God to the fullest. David at this time when he's writing the psalm was being chased by his own son. He was king. He was an older guy now. He was well established. And his son Absalom Decided he was going to take his father's throne, created an uprising. And now David is an exiled king in the desert of Judah. And this psalm comes out of him where it's like, it's all, you almost hear him just saying, I'm just sick of this. God, I just, I just want you. I just want you. I'm so sick of being thirsty and hungry all the time. Where are you? I need to drink of you. My whole body longs for you. I thirst for my God. Have you ever felt that way? Especially for you who are believers, you've been in the church a long time, and you've been walking and following God diligently, and yet you find yourself in a place where you're going through the rhythms, you do the same rote thing over and over, and yet your thirst is not quenched, and you say, God, where are you? I'm thirsty for you. Anyone feel that way? You just desire to be just plunged into God's presence and experience Him like you used to. 
And though not all of us know what we're thirsty for, all of us are thirsty for the same thing. We're thirsty for God. It's like every human heart is a vacuum. Think of a vacuum cleaner. Like Think of the ones like when you go to the gas station with just that big nozzle and it's just you know like this is what very often the unsettled hurried desperate heart is like it becomes like a vacuum cleaner that no matter where you go there is this giant sucking sound as you desire to draw just about anything into your life that will appease this thirst that you carry with you Blaise Pascal recognized this. He had a conversion from his head into his heart, where he truly experienced God, not because of some rational thought, not because he worked the math out, but because something deep and relational happened between he and God. He went from learning about God to experiencing God. And man, let me tell you, there's a big difference. There's a big difference. And Pascal was famous for saying, All of us have within our hearts a hole that is in the shape of God. That only God fits in that hole, like an incomplete puzzle piece. The most beautiful part of the piece in the middle is missing, and God is that piece. Friends, some of you are searching, you're longing, and you don't know what you're looking for. You are thirsting for God. And he's waiting for you. If you just have faith and reach out to him. St. Augustine, who was one of Pascal's biggest influencers. St. Augustine was from Africa. And uh, he also had this experience where he came to faith in the 5th century through his head. But not in his heart. And eventually had this incredible experience with God where he realized that something deeper had to happen. It couldn't just be in his head. He had to have a complete experience of God's love, life, and presence. And then he said these famous words. Our hearts are restless till they rest in him. Our hearts are restless till they rest in him. Our hearts are thirsty till they drink of him. Our hearts are hungry till they eat of him. You will never stop searching until you find God. He is the final destination. And you look into other things for life. You look into other things to be satiated. You look into other things for peace. You will not find them until you find God. And when you find God and experience him to the fullest, your whole life will be transformed. But you can't just learn about God. You have to experience him. You can't just read about him. You have to be with him. You have to be baptized in his spirit. And until that happens, you will remain hungry and you will remain thirsty and you will remain restless. But God offers us true peace, true life. Too often when we have this uh, feeling of hunger and thirst in our life, we turn to other things, usually good things, and they become idols. And so we turn to things like even friendships become a way that we try and fill that void. And entertainment becomes a way that we fill that void. And shopping becomes a way that we fill that void. Work becomes a way we fill that void. Very often it becomes substance. It becomes sex. It becomes other things that we think, if I get enough of this, we think someday if I get this thing, well then, then it'll be filled. It won't be. Not until you find And not just find, but experience God to the fullest. Psalm 27 then, we ask the question, well, what do I do? I find myself thirsty. I find myself wanting to turn to these things. What do I do? Psalm 27 gives us the answer. It finishes with this word. Wait for the Lord. Take heart. Wait for the Lord. Take heart. The first thing that we have to understand is when you are on the life raft, don't drink the salt water. Wait. Wait for fresh water. It's coming. Very often the process of waiting to experience God is the very thing that helps us grow as individuals. Living in the midst of the hunger and in the midst of the thirst very often is the thing that causes us to grow, to become the kind of people that can be world changers. Winter is an important part of the life of any plant. We don't like winter in America, do we? We want 
We want summer and fall all the time. We want to be harvesting, harvesting, harvesting. We even do that to our food, and it's a sign of our spiritual place where we decide to use anything we can to make food big, plump, and, you know, harvest all the time. You know, for us, if you want to be healthy, winter, winter is an important part of the life of every plant. It's that famous axiom that things don't grow on the mountaintop, right? They only grow in the valley. Very, very often the times when we're the most thirsty for God is the time when God is changing us and working in us uh, in, in some of the best ways. We oftentimes don't see it when we're there, but when we look back, we recognize God was doing a work in my life. Friends, if that's where you are, don't drink the salt water. Be patient. I am convinced that impatience is the greatest enemy to happiness in the modern world today. Nobody's willing to wait. Nobody's willing to be patient. Everybody's always in a hurry, and you're never present. When you're with family on a beautiful night, you're thinking about work tomorrow. Be present with your family. When you're waiting on whatever it is, we're waiting, we're, we have to move. We're waiting for, we want to move into a house. We want to hear back from it, you know? And I find myself, like, not being happy because... I want to know about my house, right? And this is, this is me too. All of us, we've, we live in this reality of constant hurry and impatience. We want to know what tomorrow holds, but when we arrive at tomorrow, we're, we're looking to the next day. It's like um, there's this deli we go to, and there's a sign on the wall, and it says, free beer tomorrow. <laughs> so every time you go in, you know, it just says, free beer tomorrow. And that's how many of our lives are. We're constantly living in, in tomorrow. We're impatient. We get mad at God because he doesn't work like a microwave. He's not a drive-through kind of God. Waiting, waiting on the Lord is, and living in the thirst is an important part of growing as a disciple to Jesus. Can I get an amen? Sometimes, however, waiting on the Lord does become a rut. And I want to speak to that too. Because in that same line from Psalm 27, he says, wait on the Lord. But after that, he says, be strong, take heart. Be strong and take heart. Take heart means to be like courageous. Take heart means do something brave. And for many of us, the valley, and if you've been there a long time, some of you are saying, Bobby, I've been here a long time. Then I have a word for you. Don't wait anymore. <laughs> Stop waiting. For some of you who your valley has become a rut, it's probably because it's time to do something brave. It's time to, to do something courageous. Many of you have never shared your faith with anyone in your whole life. Many of you have never prayed with a stranger going through difficult times. Can I tell you something? As a believer, there are few things in this world that give me more life than seeing the light of the Holy Spirit come into somebody's eyes. If you want something to bring you out of a rut, share your faith with someone. You're like, oh, no, no, sir. Fine, enjoy the rut. <laughs> Look, I'm telling you that God teaches us, God nurtures us so that we are trained to be world changers. Being a world changer is not comfortable. The Great Commission is not easy. It's a scary thing. Jesus tells his disciples, leave your home, leave your stuff, and go to a distant land. It's going to be very dangerous. You live in a world in which you can be murdered, robbed, and I just want you to go, and I want you to die as a martyr and share your faith. If the first thing you're thinking about when it comes to sharing your faith or praying with a stranger or something like that, if you think to yourself, that would be socially awkward, you're the perfect person to do it because you understand social norms you'll do it the right way in fact the guy that probably doesn't need to do it is like heck yeah i'm going out there i'll pray for everybody i'm going to witness to everyone that's the guy that you're like just you know what go on retreat and just chill out for a while <laughs> it's the person who's like that's really scary i don't know what i would say that would be weird you're going to be the right person because you understand you understand social norms but it takes it still takes courage but you'll do it the right way. I know, because ever since I sent out the invitation, next time somebody says they're doing okay, you ask them what's wrong, they tell you what's wrong, you say, can I pray for you? I've had like four of you 
tell me that you actually did it. I'm proud of you. Good job. And all of them were awesome stories. And you know, all four of those people, it was really hard to say, can I pray for you? Like, it was like really hard to say that, right? But friends, we ha- if you are in a rut, if you have been in an eternal winter, it's, it's time to do something brave for God. And, and I, I don't mean like, you know, jump off a cl- cliff or something. That's brave for you. You know, I mean, share your faith with someone. I mean, uh, offer to pray with someone who's suffering. I mean, to give a gift to a neighbor or, or someone who is in need that is that's a scary amount. I mean, doing something that is a big risk, and it's not for you, it's for God. I remember um, when I was in high school, and I decided, after leading the first person ever to faith, that it was like an addiction, like telling people about Jesus. It brought me so much life. The thing that was amazing about it was, I first started with the sort of like, you know, somewhat popular kids in the school, you know, and the nice kids, and they just were not interested in my religion. But when I talked to a heroin addict at her school who was in the occult, she loved what I was talking about. And then I realized God's called me to witness to the bad kids. And I remember like one of the first guys that was really following me was the drug dealer in our school. And he didn't quit dealing drugs when he started following me. He was following me around and talked to me about the Bible. And he's like, hang on one second, I'm going to make a deal. I'll be right back. <laughs> and he'd come, he'd come back. I just kind of lived in that, you know. But I found, I found that when I went to college and I stopped being around the bad kids and I stopped witnessing and sharing my faith that I entered into a winter in my life. Very often, the only way you're going to get out of your rut is if you act in faith. And do something brave for God. Do something brave for God today. Do it right now. Do do something brave for the Lord. And you will drink of his water again. God honors those who take faith and trust in him and not in themselves. He, He blesses them with his spirit. He blesses them with favor and with his power. Because they're doing his work. Do something brave for the Lord today. Am I right? Doing something brave for God. Doing something brave for God brings life to us. So some of you, especially if you're in ministry, you need to stop and wait. You know who you are. Some of us, we need to wait. We need to live in the thirst. But if you've been thirsty for a long time, it's time to activate the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. Would you bow your heads with me? I want to invite everyone who's in this church today and everyone watching on television, if you want to know the Lord, to pray this prayer with me. And even if you're already a believer, pray this prayer with me. Father in heaven, I am thirsty for you. Forgive me of my sins. Make me your student. Give me your Holy Spirit. And teach me what it means. to to live your life. In Jesus' name. Amen.